So um, anyway, our upcoming meetings are all scheduled for the rest of the year. October 5th, we're going to have a presentation by somebody from the Churchville Nature Center speaking on the Lenai Lenape, the original uh, inhabitants of this area. And um, on November 2nd, uh, Mike Wunsch is going to present on uh, John Vree, uh, the uh, really influential person in uh, Fox Chase Vereeville area in the 19th century. And then on December 7th, uh, Patty McCarthy, my wife, will be speaking on the history of the Morelton Inn in Tarsa, which is a really fascinating building if you don't know anything about that. So tune into those or show up again the first Wednesday evening uh, of every month at seven o'clock. Um, here's a view of our uh, history fair that we had um, a couple of months ago at Constaters. We'll be having that again in 2024. And lastly, just a little pitch that I always give. Um, we never charge for any of our events. Everything is free and open to the public. We do uh, encourage and appreciate donations. So if you're so inclined, you can go to our Facebook page, the Northeast Philadelphia History Network Facebook page and hit a shop now button that you'll find on there, which will take you to a donate button, which you hit that will take you to a page where you can make a donation by either a credit card or a debit card or uh, through PayPal. So. Now on to the main attraction, the historical highlights of Northeast Philadelphia. And um, first, we're going to start with some geography, like what is the Northeast? Um, Northeast Philadelphia, there, there's many disputes and arguments and opinions about what constitutes the Northeast. But uh, legally, technically, historically, it's the area of Philadelphia north of the Taconi Frankfurt Creek, all the way up to the Bucks County line at Oquesting Creek. So here on this map, it's that shaded area in the upper right-hand corner. If you see where it says Philadelphia, the last H and I in Philadelphia, that's the Taconi Frankfurt Creek. Um, and then you go all the way up to the upper right-hand corner, that's the Oquesting Creek. So that area in there is, is Northeast Philadelphia. And it's essentially bisected by the Pennypack Creek, which is a major creek right kind of through the heart of the Northeast. So um, that's what we mean by the Northeast. Prior to 1854, Northeast Philadelphia, what we today call Northeast Philadelphia, was not part of the city of Philadelphia. It was part of the county of Philadelphia and they were separate. That square uh, area in the middle there, that was the city prior to 1854. It was just a very small, like two square mile, three square mile area from the Delaware to the Schuylkill River and from Vine Street to South Street. That was the city of Philadelphia. Everything else was the county of Philadelphia and comprised of townships and boroughs, these local governments that are all within the county of Philadelphia. So here is a map of uh, the townships of Northeast Philadelphia prior to 1854. On the far right is Byberry Township and coming left, there's Moreland Township, Lower Dublin Township, Oxford Township. These were all local governments that comprised Northeast Philadelphia prior to 1854. Uh, on the far, on the lower part of the Northeast, down by the Taconi Frankfurt Creek, there were several boroughs. Frankfurt was a borough, Bridesburg was a borough, Whitehall was a borough. These were smaller or well, more urbanized uh, local governments that were smaller than, than townships. So all these townships and boroughs comprised what is now Northeast Philadelphia until 1854, when the city and the county were consolidated by an act of the state legislature and the city boundaries expanded out to encompass the entire county of Philadelphia. And all those local governments were abolished, all those townships and boroughs, and they uh, were now all absorbed into the city of Philadelphia. And from that point on, the Northeast Philadelphia was part of the city of Philadelphia. The city was divided into wards and all of the Northeast was part of the 23rd ward. ward many more wards were added in later years, but originally we were all, uh, the 23rd ward encompassed all of the Northeast. And here's a couple of maps. You can see that the far Northeast is the area from Penny Pack Creek up to Pequesson Creek. And the lower northeast is the area between uh, the, the Pennypack Creek and down to the Taconi Frankfurt Creek. So the lower northeast and the upper northeast. 
Um, Bridesburg is a kind of a, an exception. I'm not gonna dwell on it too much, but um, Bridesburg was originally just below the Frankfurt, Tacconi Frankfurt Creek. You can see here, the creek kind of winds around Bridesburg, which is below. So at that point, it really wasn't part of the Northeast. But in the, that area, because of the, all the curves in the, in the, in the uh, creek, that area was prone to flooding, so it flood out all the time. So the Army Corps of Engineers in the 1950s straightened Frankfurt Creek. It went straight down to the river instead of having that big curve. And from then on, Bridesburg was north of the Taconi Frankfurt Creek. So technically from the 1950s on, Bridesburg was part of the Northeast, but prior to the 1950s, it was not. It was really just a technicality. But here you can see the, the creek, which is following the on-ramp to the Betsy Ross Bridge there, just below Bridesburg. That's the redirected creek. Uh, talking about creeks and streams, uh, you really can't see it too well on the screen here. I trust you can see it pretty well on Zoom at home. But uh, Philadelphia, this is a map of all the creeks and streams uh, in the city prior to uh, European settlement and development. Uh, and this is the remaining streams, almost all of which were obliterated and turned into sewers. These are maps from uh, the great historian of the water, Philadelphia Water Department, um, Adam Levine. So you can see this comparison here on the left are all these creeks and streams all over the city. And then in later years, they were all channeled into sewers and covered over, except in the far Northeast above the, the Pennypack Creek, that area got developed much later, basically after the Second World War. And at that point, city planners and developers were uh, obligated or committed to preserving the creeks and streams. So all the development went around the creeks and streams. So here in the far Northeast, um, we still have almost all of our original creeks and streams, whereas the rest of the city uh, does not. So <clears throat> that was the... Um, geographic sort of parameters of our talk. And now I'm gonna get into the heart of it. And this talk really would probably be better entitled historical superlatives of Northeast Philadelphia, because I'm really gonna talk about things that are the oldest this or the first that or the largest or the only surviving or the especially important. So it's kind of things in the Northeast that are really um, landmark uh, events and sites. The first being the oldest really is the historic Pennypack Creek Bridge, which traverses the Pennypack Creek uh, on Frankfurt Avenue. Frankfurt Avenue was originally known as the King's Highway, and then later it was called Bristol Pike, and then still later Frankfurt Avenue. But this bridge was constructed around 1697 at the direction of William Penn, the founder of Pennsylvania and Philadelphia, and uh, he wanted a a convenient way to cross the waterways from Philadelphia up to his estate in Bucks County, which is now called Pensbury Manor. Um, so this bridge was built at William Penn's uh, direction, somewhere around 1697. Uh, it was widened in 1893 for the trolley service, had a major renovation a few years ago, and we had the, the manager of that project give one of our, I'm sorry, louder? Okay, I have to speak louder. Um, I, I got to check if this is, uh, that microphone's in the way there on the screen, I can't. So um, anyway, bear with me a minute. Um, this is the oldest roadway bridge perhaps in the new world, definitely in the United States, that's still in use. And, and it's uh, one of our landmarks of Northeast Philadelphia history. And I start with that. It's kind of one of the earliest things. Um, it's a gorgeous bridge. Um, this is a beautiful uh, photo of it with horses crossing in the early 20th century. Uh, a number of years ago, <clears throat> they had a historical marker, state marker, Fred Moore, our uh, active board member of the Friends of Northeast Philadelphia History arranged all that. I'm sorry? Yeah, I think it got knocked down soon. Yeah, it got knocked down soon after. Yeah, all right. Yeah. 
Um, so another historical, uh, important historical event um, in the Northeast was this meeting in the late August of 1774 between John Adams and members of the delegation from Massachusetts and Benjamin Rush and delegates from Pennsylvania that were preparing to meet for the first Continental Congress. Um, this, the backstory here is um, there were 13 colonies that comprised America, you know, Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, Virginia, Massachusetts. And um, there was a lot of disputes and grievances with the mother country, England, and these disputes were getting very heated and intense. So there was a conference called or, or a Congress in Philadelphia of delegates from all of these colonies. And John Adams and the uh, delegates from a group of four or five from Massachusetts were coming down from Massachusetts to meet in Philadelphia. They crossed the Pennypack Bridge and a few miles beyond that in Frankfurt, uh, they were met by Benjamin Rush and a number of delegates from Pennsylvania. And Benjamin Rush and the Pennsylvanians had a very important message for the Massachusetts group. And that was that the Massachusetts group was viewed by the rest of the colonies as really radical and extremist and um, sort of uh, hell bent on independence from the mother country. And most of the other colonies were not ready for that yet. And they were very suspicious, very wary of the Massachusetts delegates. And um, so Benjamin Rush and the Pennsylvanians were telling John Adams and the guys from Massachusetts, um, do not take the lead in the discussions at the Continental Congress because you are viewed with much suspicion and, and much apprehension. And it's best that you let the delegates from Virginia take the lead because Virginia is the most populous and respected and wealthy colony uh, in America and everybody will follow their lead. They won't follow your lead because you're viewed with, with uh, a lot of apprehension. Years later in a letter to uh, a friend of his, and this is 1822, but towards the end of uh, John Adams's life, he writes about the Frankfurt advice. He spelled it with a T, not a D at the end of Frankfurt. But he was saying in this letter that it was because of this advice that he was able to craft a strategy to achieve independence. And he did it by letting the Virginians take all the leading roles. So George Washington was chosen to lead the Continental Army. Thomas Jefferson was chosen to write the Declaration of Independence. Richard Henry Lee was chosen as the one to introduce the motion in the Second Continental Congress uh, for independence. These are all Virginians. And what uh, John Adams was saying was that had it not been for that Frankfurt meeting, none of that would have happened. And that Frankfurt meeting basically set the course of uh, for independence of America. So he was saying it, you know, it was the Frankfurt advice that really set the whole course. We don't know exactly, uh, Adams was not specific as to where in Frankfurt that meeting was held. It was probably either the Jolly Post in, uh, which was the leading tavern right on the King's Highway in Frankfurt, or it all, could have been McVeigh's Tavern, which was another prominent tavern in Frankfurt at that time. Most of these meetings were usually in, in, in taverns. So one of those two places, uh, this very important event happened that sort of shaped the whole course of American independence. Um, also in Frankfurt, we had one of the earliest um, sites of worship in Philadelphia. Uh, Frankfurt Friends Meeting was established in 1682, and it's still there in the same spot, Unity and Paul Streets in Frankfurt. Um, and many other meetings started somewhere and then moved somewhere else, or churches would start somewhere and then move. This meeting is in the same place it was in 1682. And the current meeting house, which is pictured there, built in 1775, is the oldest Quaker meeting house in, in Philadelphia. The meeting was originally called Oxford Meeting after Oxford Township. Later, it was called Frankfurt Meeting. Now it's called Unity Frankfurt Monthly Meeting. Um, but it's still there, and people that were buried there in 1682, those graves are still there. There's another view of it. 
Another very old church, I'm jumping all around geographically, but I'm kind of sort of going chronologically through these key stories. Uh, up in the Lawndale neighborhood um, is Trinity Church Oxford, which is another extremely old and uh, historic congregation uh, in Philadelphia that's still in the same place. Uh, there was a Quaker meeting on the site in the 1690s, uh, and then it converted to Church of England <clears throat> services in 1696. The current building was built in 1711, the first part of it. Uh, so it's, again, one of the earliest, oldest church buildings uh, in, in Philadelphia. And then after the revolution, you know, the Anglican Church, Church of England in America uh, turned into the Episcopal Protestant Church, and Trinity Oxford was one of the leading uh, congregations in that movement. Jumping back down to Frankfurt, uh, the uh, local Quakers outside of Frankfurt established Friends Hospital in 1813. It's the nation's oldest private psychiatric hospital, uh, and it's still there, still going. Uh, here's some views of it. Um, and the, one of the buildings on the campus of um, Friends Hospital is, was uh, the first uh, institutional gymnasium in America. Um, you know, athletics and exercise at that time, and I guess still are considered like therapeutic treatment for um, mental illness. So they built this building with equipment and all kinds of gear uh, for exercise for the, the patients. Uh, here's an interior view of it. And this was the first purpose-built gymnasium building in America. Uh, it was demolished when they widened Roosevelt Boulevard uh, in the early 20th century, that building. Uh, also down in Frankfurt <clears throat> was, and still is somewhat, this building, the Park Hotel, uh, right on uh, Frankfurt Avenue, where it intersects with Kensington Avenue. And in this building, in 1831, a group of Frankfurt businessmen, now, by this time, Frankfurt is a very highly industrialized section of the city. There's a lot of mills and factories and a lot of uh, dense population. And these uh, mill owners and business leaders of Frankfurt got together and formed Oxford Provident Building Association. The first savings and loan in the United States was established there in Frankfurt in 1831. What became eventually a multi-billion dollar industry started in, in the Lower Northeast in this uh, Park Hotel um, in, um, in Frankfurt. And the first house for which Oxford Provident issued a mortgage is still standing in Frankfurt. It's, it's called the Comley Rich House. Uh, he was the owner of the house. He, or he, you know, got a mortgage from Oxford Provident to have the house built. Uh, he was. He did a number of things, but he was primarily known as the Frankfurt's lamp lighter. You know, he would go around and and light the the gas lamps. Um, and that house is still there. Uh, here's a photo of it on the left from, from a few years ago. Um, this was, I took this photo around Halloween. So that's the house next door is all decorated with, with Halloween decorations. Was that? Uh, Orchard Street, uh, right near Church Street in Frank, just east of Frankfurt Avenue. Um, somebody asked what street is it on in Frankfurt? Um, and incidentally, Comley Rich defaulted on his mortgage. So the very first mortgage issued by the very first savings and loan in the United States ended in default. So, um, this house is on the Historic American Building Survey. You can go research it, see all the plans and everything for it. Um, and the Park Hotel building is actually still there. If you look on the, on the photo on the right, you see the peak of the building. There's this you know, ugly auto place in, <laughs> built on in front of it, but the building is still there. I've never been in it. I've heard people in, that have entered and said it's beautiful inside, but you can't tell. This is a, a, um, a photograph from Wamrath Park. If anybody knows Frankfurt, where Kensington and Frankfurt Avenues meet, there's this park. It's kind of a triangular plot. Um, so this is right across the street from that. So that building is still there. <clears throat> um, jumping geographically again, but trying to keep pace uh, chronologically, uh, is the story of Robert Purvis and Byberry Hall. Robert Purvis was this African-American uh, activist and abolitionist who um, 
was very wealthy and very committed. Uh, he, he, he was mixed race and he could have easily passed for white, but he chose not to. He, he, his, his mother was uh, African-American, his father was Scottish, and uh, he was very light complected, inherited a lot of money from his father, but he chose to identify with the African-American side of his heritage and worked tirelessly for abolition and civil rights. So in, he's living in downtown Philadelphia with his family in the 1840s, and there are all the, it's a racial tinderbox in the city at this point, and there's these race riots where he's living, and because he's known as such an activist, abolitionist, uh, he himself was targeted, and he and his family were in danger, so he took his family and he relocated to Byberry Township, which at that point is out in the boondocks. Um, it's the outer edge of Philadelphia County. So he moves there with his family, he buys this very uh, elegant mansion, uh, makes the house a stop on the Underground Railroad, uh, helps thousands of um, es escaped enslaved people to freedom. Uh, and then he gets involved in the Byberry community. He lives right across the street from Byberry Friends Meeting. Uh, I don't know how well you can see this, but uh, you'll see right there where it says Byberry. That's the village of Byberry, which is on Byberry Road and what's today Thornton Road. Uh, the Quaker Meeting House and Quaker School and a post office were all there. And Purvis lived essentially across the street. You can see the two plots of land that he owned on either side of Byberry Road, over 100 acres altogether. And he becomes active in the community. And uh, he does not, he is not a Quaker himself, but he's working with a lot of Quakers. And Byberry Meeting, uh, another very early congregation, was established in 1683. Uh, and then it moved to its current location in the 1690s. So this is another congregation that has been in its current location for over three centuries. Um, and they, it was a very active community there in Byberry. And uh, Robert Purvis gets involved in a number of the activities. And he and a number of, uh, or, or three other, two other members of the Quaker meeting get together and they build Byberry Hall in 1846. And they build it specifically as a meeting place for abolition meetings and social justice causes and things of that nature. And it becomes a, a spot on the speaking circuit of all the prominent abolitionists and social activists of the mid 19th century. So a lot of famous people uh, speak at Byberry Hall. Here's a notice in the Pennsylvania Freeman, which is a newspaper uh, in 1847. There's a meeting at Byberry Hall. Robert Purvis, Lucretia Mott and others were going to discuss slavery, capital punishment and other kindred evils. So you can see this is like a real nexus of social activism here in way out in the boondocks of Northeast Philadelphia in the 1840s. Uh, Byberry Hall is still there. <clears throat> Over the years, it, it came into the possession of Byberry Meeting, which is it's now part of the Byberry Meeting campus. <clears throat> um, on the left is a photo from 1905. On the right is a photo I took a few years ago, and uh, there's, there's significant developments since then. Um, the the Quaker meeting uh, owned the building for many years and rented it out to a martial arts studio. And the proprietor of that business retired a few years ago and left the building. And now it's back in the sort of active management of the meeting. And the meeting is looking for ways to make this a historic center in the Northeast, a, a, a local history center. And we are in discussions, the Friends of Northeast Philadelphia History are in discussions with library meeting members about how we can work together on that. So hopefully, and they, they just got a grant, a state grant to help renovate the building. They need to raise some more money for the project to, to proceed, but we're hoping it'll be all renovated and accessible and we'll work with them on creating a history center. I'm sorry, what? I can't hear you. No, okay. I'm talking as loud as I can, but I'm being told people can't hear you. Uh, um, a few years ago, uh, well, 2014, more than a few years ago now, um, we had a historical marker installed in, outside of Byberry Hall. And uh, my wife, Patty, was able to track down uh, descendants of Robert Purvis. And that's them there under the marker. That's a, actually a brother and sister 
And then the uh, little girl is the daughter of the brother. Uh, so they are direct descendants. Their name is Purvis. Um, and they were able to come and participate in the dedication of this marker, uh, you know, honoring Robert Purvis and, and all his activism in Byberry. Uh, we're jumping now, uh, again, geographically down to another section of uh, Northeast Philadelphia, down to Wissanoming, and the story of Matthias Baldwin. Uh, he built a summer estate along the Delaware River um, <clears throat> that, uh, that he called Wissanoming, and from that estate name, that's where the neighborhood of Wissanoming takes its name. And uh, he's a fascinating figure. He's an inventor, an engineer. He later becomes a successful industrialist and philanthropist. He started his career um, at the age of 16, working as an apprentice to a jeweler in Frankfurt. Uh, but then he begins tinkering with machines and building engines and, and all kinds of equipment for technical uses. Uh, he builds the first railway in Philadelphia. Uh, one of the first in America in 19, 1832. It's the Philadelphia Germantown Norristown Railway. And then a few years later, he founds Baldwin Locomotive Works, begins manufacturing locomotives. Eventually, it becomes the world's largest maker of locomotives. Um, that's the uh, Philadelphia, Philadelphia Germantown Norristown Railway. And that on the right there is the engine, the locomotive engine, one of the early ones that he built. Uh, his company was eventually settled uh, on Broad Street around Spring Garden um, in that area. Uh, and it, it, as you can see, it developed into this enormous complex. Uh, it's the largest private company in Philadelphia history by far. At its height, this was a little after um, Baldwin's death, but at its height, he employed over 18,000 workers. It was in a massive enterprise. Um, but his, you know, his retreat was in the Northeast. Uh, and uh, he actually died there in 1866. And then in 1888, it was acquired by the Old Ladies Home Association of Philadelphia. And uh, they made it into a, you know, a, a sort of a nursing home for, for uh, elderly women. And it stayed that way. I, I, I think there are some people that maybe still remember it. Remember it right. Yeah, maybe in the 50s. Into the 1950s, there, I know there are some people here that remember it a little before my time, but, um, well, I'm gonna show you in a minute. Um, but anyway, it, it was demolished somewhat after the, sometime after the 50s. Uh, here's some views of it. Here's an interior view. And here's where it was. So this is Comley and State Road, if you're familiar with that. And then here is a view of what the lot looks like now. If you're looking, this is uh, State Road. Uh, and you're looking towards the river, there's that um, Newman Paperboard Company right on the river. It's kind of right in front of that. That's where this home was. Now, at the time it was built, it was an idyllic, natural, pastoral setting. Now it's all industrialized. And, and a lot of these mansions along the river were, you know, originally in beautiful, natural settings, and then the area became highly industrialized, and nobody wanted to live there anymore, so... Not too far from um, the Baldwin estate in Wissanoming is the home of Robert Cornelius, known as Lawndale. Uh, it's not to be confused with the neighborhood of Lawndale. This is the name of the estate in Wissanoming. And Robert Cornelius, another fascinating uh, figure, he, um, a metallurgist and inventor, a lighting designer and manufacturer, he had a big uh, lighting and fixture company. Uh, he supplied a lot of the illumination for the 1876 centennial. Uh, and, um, he just, and then he, but in the 1830s, he began to experiment. He was one of the early experimenters with photography, which was this brand new technology that was just emerging originally from France and uh, made its way over here. And so in the late 1830s, he's one of the few people that are started to to take photos. And um, this is his uh, company of Cornelius and Baker. Um, but he, in October of 1839, he takes this self-portrait with this new camera thing that he's helping to develop. And this is considered the world's first photographic portrait of a human being. 
Nowadays, all the websites are calling it the first selfie. But it, you know, it, it, he he had to set up the camera and then he had to run run around to the front and stand there. And that's why he said it's all off centered. And there's a blurry section. Uh, but this is the world's first photograph of a human being taken by a Northeast Philadelphian. Not it, he didn't take it in the Northeast, but he lived in the Northeast at the time. Uh, in the years after his death, his big estate uh, right on Frankfurt Avenue in Wissanoming uh, was purchased by the city and made into Wissanoming Park. Um, Cornelius had exotic trees from all over the world that he planted on his estate. Uh, again, this is in the 18, mid 1800s, late 1800s. And um, a lot of the descendants or children of those trees are still there uh, in Wissanoming Park. And here's some views of, uh, there used to be this huge lake there. Uh, but these are views of uh, Wissanoming Park, which was originally the Cornelius estate. Uh, around the same time, another amazing industrialist uh, moves into, well, he doesn't, himself he doesn't move, but he moves his company into the Northeast, into Coney, and that's Henry Diston. Uh, he, he's an Im English immigrant. He came from England to Philadelphia in 1833. Uh, in 1840, he establishes a, a saw works. He's making saws in Northern Liberties. Uh, his business gets too large. He needs more space. He begins to move it to Tacconi in the 1870s, and it becomes the largest saw manufacturer in the world. Uh, another massive complex, uh, you know, industrial, because Philadelphia was an industrial powerhouse at this time. And these guys that I'm talking about were all sort of key figures in that. Um, so he, he eventually builds this humongous saw works. Uh, in Tacconi, and it's producing millions of saws and selling them all over the world. It's the large, largest saw manufacturer. Here are some of the workers. Um, but the, that's fascinating in and of itself. But what's even more fascinating is he was very forward thinking. He and his wife, Mary, were very forward thinking, and they wanted to create uh, affordable quality housing for the workers in a nice, stable, family-oriented community. So Henry and Mary Diston established the Diston Estate, which has these specific boundaries. And within that, they began building and renting or selling at affordable prices, housing for their workers, modest homes, but quality uh, and, you know, uh, a place, and they had all these deed restrictions that couldn't be any alcohol served, there couldn't be any factories within this. Uh, this was all just a family centered worker community. And there were only two such kind of utopian worker communities established in urban areas in the United States at this time. Tacconi with the distance and the Pullman company outside of Chicago. The Pullman uh, made the, the train cars. Uh, so these are the only two uh, areas of the country that, that had these utopian worker communities like intentionally built that way. Um, and here's, you know, building lots for $5 a month, own your own home. Um, and uh, the distant estate is now on the National Register and the Philadelphia uh, Historic Register. So it's just really important, fascinating story, both the industrial side, but also the social kind of uh, housing and ec equitable housing side of the story. Very nearby, the, uh, the um, distant saw works was the Tacconi Iron Company. And that's the company that built the statue of William Penn that sits atop of City Hall uh, in the 1890s. It's the largest statue atop a building anywhere in the world. I, I forget how many tons it is. I've seen that somewhere, but um, here's some views of it. You know, it's just enormous. And there's William Penn looking out over a city atop City Hall. Uh, he's looking to the Northeast and there is a story which I don't really, give any credence to that he's looking towards Tacconi where he was built, but <laughs> I, I don't think that's, <laughs> yeah, but I kind of doubt it. <laughs> um, another uh, fascinating figure in Tacconi in this period is Frank Schumann, who is a, a young engineer, inventor, uh, entrepreneur. He, his uncle owns the, is president of the Tacconi Iron Company, and young Frank comes to Tacconi to work on 
the William Penn statue, but he's inventing all kinds of things. And he um, becomes a pioneer in solar power, which was very unusual at that time. And uh, this is his house in Taconi, which is still there. And in his backyard, he built this direct acting solar engine. And it was like a, a, on a timer, it you know, followed the path of the sun and the solar energy created uh, enough energy power to run an engine. And so he's working on this and perfecting it and developing it, it's getting some notoriety. And in 1912, the British government hires him to build the world's first solar powered plant outside of Cairo in Egypt. Uh, Egypt was then a British colony. And of course the Nile River and the um, really strong solar power in that part of the world, um, they thought it would be ideal for a solar power plant. So they hired um, Schumann and he brings a bunch of engineers and operators including a lot from Taconi over to, to this site outside of Cairo. They build this massive uh, solar power plant. It's working and everything. Uh, and then World War I breaks out and everybody has to flee. All the engineers and operators, including Frank Schumann, they got to leave. The plant sort of goes idle and inactive and deteriorates. And then there's no trace of it after a number of years. But it was the site of the first uh, sol world's first solar power plant built by a guy from Taconi. And this um, quote that he uh, gave in 1914 is just you know, so visionary. The human race must finally utilize direct sun power or revert to barbarism. I mean, he envisioned this world where this dependence on oil and gas, uh, you know, was going to sort of cause world, you know, chaos. And um, he was promoting solar power. Um, it's just an interesting um, uh, story is uh, the Taconi Historical Society, uh, this woman, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago now, I can't remember, um, inherited a house from one of her, her uh, you know, ancestors and there were all these photos in the house and she brought them to the Taconi Historical Society. It turns out that they were photos the only known photos of this solar power plant in Egypt. These photos that I'm showing you here, these are all found in a house in Taconi given to the Taconi Historical Society. So like some of the only known photographs in the world of the world's first solar power plant in Egypt are at the Historical Society of Taconi, which is kind of crazy. Um, I think Schumann died in April of 1918. A few weeks later, um, the first airmail delivery, regularly scheduled airmail delivery in the United States happened in Bustleton, May 15th. The, um, the Postal Service is starting this airmail service for the first time. It's the plane's gonna take off from New York, land in Philadelphia, exchange some mail, and then go on to Washington, DC. So the first leg, the first landing is in Philadelphia and it's at this airfield in Bustleton called Bustleton Field and uh, essentially uh, at Red Line Road and the Boulevard, right in that area there. Um, and this is where this plane landed and they did the airmail exchange. And here's some photos of it happened in May of 1918. And then to mark the hundredth anniversary of that event, we, the Friends of Northeast Philadelphia History had a, a celebration there at that spot. Um, and we had all kinds of dignitaries and music and events and sold t-shirts. I think we still have those t-shirts for sale. We still have some we could sell. Uh, and then we also unveiled a stark marker um, that marks that um, spot. Uh, this is not a state historical marker. This is one that we, <laughs> we had manufactured ourselves. Um, so uh, it was a great event, uh, marking a really important milestone uh, in Northeast Philadelphia history. Uh, so that event we had on May, uh, I think we had it on May, May 19th, just a few days off from 100 years. Um, another interesting fact, um, 
When the city of Philadelphia was planning to build an international airport before it had one, they were scouting different locations and a group of business people from the Northeast were proposing that the Philadelphia International Airport be located um, at basically the Boulevard and Byberry Road. Uh, what many of us for the rest of our lives will call the Nabisco site, which doesn't exist anymore. Nabisco building is long gone, but that's where um, they were proposing the Philadelphia International Airport be located. And thankfully, it was decided to put it south of the city, not in the Northeast. So I'm glad that that didn't happen. It would have been a really uh, noisy place to live. Um, jumping back down to Frankfurt, we had the first professional NFL football team in Philadelphia was the Frankfurt Yellow Jackets from 1924 to 1931. Um, this is some photos of the team members. This was their stadium, which was actually technically in Wissanoming at Frankfurt and Devereux streets. Um, and they won the NFL championship in 1926. And then about five years later, they kind of went defunct uh, the license for the NFL franchise, NFL license for Philadelphia kind of lapsed and was taken up by these guys that started the Philadelphia Eagles. So in a sense, the, uh, the Frankfurt Yellow Jackets were the forerunner of the Philadelphia Eagles. We had the first professional football team in, in Philadelphia. Uh, lastly, I'm gonna go over a few historic riverfront estates in the Northeast. Uh, many of you may have seen my other presentation up the Lazy River, which is all about the historical estates in the Northeast. Um, this, I'm just going to pick a few buildings to highlight that, that I give an entire talk about. But the one is uh, Port Royal, which is outside of Frankfurt, near the river, um, I guess closer now to what would be Bridesburg. Um, there it is on the right there. Um, and uh, this was a really elaborate, you know, um, expensive estate and house built uh, by Edward Stiles. And uh, here's a, 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 an entry from the diary of Elizabeth Drinker, who was a famous diarist at that, in the late 1700s. Um, she, she was a neighbor of the Drinkers and she wrote in her diary on December 6th, how the British who then occupied Philadelphia during the Revolutionary War sort of plundered um, the estate of Port Royal and took all, all their possessions and some of their uh, Negroes, it says, it says eight or 10 Negroes. I don't know if they were enslaved people or, or free servants or what, but um, the, that estate got plundered by the British. And then in later years, as I said, that whole area began to get developed and highly industrialized. And so this Port Royal, which was sitting on this beautiful vista along the river, now you can see in, in what this view that you're seeing here is from the railroad track, which went, went right by the house and there's all these cars. So it became uh, you know, very unappealing and uninhabited, it began to deteriorate. Uh, the family that owned it was trying to even give it away. Nobody wanted it. And into the picture comes Henry Francis DuPont who's based in Wilmington. He's an heir to the DuPont fortune, but he's a collector of early American fine and decorative arts. And he's collecting them all down in his estate outside of Wilmington. Uh, he has a friend named J.A. Lloyd Hyde, who is also a dealer and a collector of historic sites and uh, memorabilia. And uh, Hyde is taking the train back and forth from Wilmington to New York uh, in his dealings with DuPont. And he notices this magnificent estate that's now deteriorating right by the railroad tracks. He alerts Henry Francis DuPont. Uh, long story short, DuPont buys the estate in 1928, has these detailed architectural drawings made, strips it of all the doors and windows and finishings and furnishings, not the furnishings so much, they were gone, but you know, the fixtures and the, uh, and the woodwork and all the elaborate paneling and everything. And he brings, and so this is what it looks like afterwards. And he brings all this stuff to his um, Wilmington estate where he's collecting it. And he starts to formulate plans to create a museum there because he's collecting other estates as well. And um, that's the genesis of the Winterthur Museum. 
was this collecting. And Port Royal, more than any other estate, was the sort of inspiration for Winterthur. Once he got all this stuff, he's, all right, I now have to build this museum. So this is the Winterthur Parlor, or I'm sorry, the Port Royal Parlor at Winterthur. Um, here's the Port Royal hallway in the doorway. And if you look here, um, you can't see it too well, but um, on the upper left, that's Winterthur. You see the door uh, with the pediment and everything? That's the door and pediment from uh, Port Royal, just literally transferred to Winterthur, becomes the main entrance. So Port Royal, this estate in Frankfurt in the lower Northeast, becomes sort of the inspiration for this world famous Winterthur Museum. And if you go there, you'll see a lot of the Port Royal furnishings and whatnot. Here's some more images of all that. Uh, that was down in the outside of Frankfurt in the Bridesburg kind of area. Coming up the river uh, in Holmesburg was the estate of Edwin Forrest, renowned, the most famous actor in America in the 19th century. The Forrest Theater in Philadelphia is named for him, but it was built long after he died, so he never uh, performed there. But he purchased this estate in Holmesburg called Springbrook in 1865. And then he put in his will that when he died, it should become a home for aged actors, like a retirement home for actors. So he dies in 1872. Four years later, the Forest Home opens in Holmesburg and is there until the 1920s. Here's some views of it. Um, and um, Here's some of the residents. And Fred, maybe you can uh, uh, verify. I think in his will, he had a stipulation that the, the, the residents had to perform twice a year on Shakespeare's birthday and on his birthday. Is that correct? Oh, OK. All right, well, one was a 4th of July. Well, they had to perform on the 4th of July and one other time. It was either Shakespeare's birthday or Forrest's birthday. But what happened was this little, there's this now this acting community in Holmesburg, right, in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And so there's like plays and all this theater life in this little village in, in, the, in the Northeast. Uh, here's a view of the interior of the home and that statue at the end of the hall uh, is in the lobby of the Walnut Street Theater where Forrest often performed. The Walnut Street Theater opened in the early 1800s and it was the main theater when in Philadelphia when Forrest was at his height. So he performed there often. So that statue that is a bust or a statue of him in a Shakespearean role is now in the uh, Walnut Street Theater lobby. A little further up uh, the river, yes. Uh, not where St. You. Um, uh, the question is where exactly was the forest home? Uh, I, I won't have exact. Um, back. Yeah, there, there's a forest school there now, but the estate essentially went from Cotman Avenue almost to Ron Street, not quite to Ron Street, and from Frankfurt Avenue, almost to Tarsdale Avenue. It was a huge estate. Um, and yeah, St. Hubert's would be closer to the river than where the house was. But that whole area was where the house was. And uh, there is a forest school in Holmesburg that kind of was where the house was, right? So that, yeah, that was a question of the location of, uh, of the forest home. Uh, the next riverfront estate I want to talk about is Harrison's Folly. My wife, Patty, did a lot of research and, and gave a presentation on this. Uh, Joseph Harrison was another brilliant inventor, engineer, uh, becomes a railroad executive. He, he builds a, uh, a device for locomotives, a stabilizing device that uh, Matthias Baldwin eventually employs that helps them all become rich. Uh, and then Harrison uh, in the 1840s and his partners go to Russia and build this massive railroad project for the Tsar of Russia. And they become incredibly wealthy. And they come home, and then he's an art collector and a writer. Uh, and um, he purchases this state called Riverdale, right where the Pennypack Creek enters into the Delaware River. He builds this Russian style onion domed 
building, his home, which is really odd for Northeast Philly in the, in the 1800s. And then he also undertakes this massing, massive dredging operation along the river. And that's where the Harrison's Folly comes in. Uh, it was this project that everybody thought was uh, detrimental to his health and was never going to get finished. And, and so it's, the, the whole property becomes known as Harrison's Folly. Um, here it is where it empties into the Delaware River. But this is the uh, building, the home. You can see the Onion Dome there. Uh, you know, he obviously got this from his time in Russia. And uh, a lot of the boats that used to ply the Delaware River, that was a landmark, you know, when they passed the the Onion Dome, they knew they were at a certain point in the journey. Um, and then um, in the early 1900s, the city of Philadelphia um, tries to acquire the land to build the Tarsdale filtration plant. They get into a legal dispute with Harrison's widow, long gets drawn out, but eventually the city builds the Tarsdale filtration plant uh, that's still there. Uh, on the estate. You can see in the far left corner there, the, the Onion Dome uh, on the river. Uh, and you can see it in the far distance there as well. And so this uh, plant opens in the early 1900s and is one of the major water supply filtration plants. Tarsdale, now we're into Tarsdale. We're up in the far Northeast, the edge of the city. Tarsdale is this enclave of the wealthy, influential uh, Philadelphia class uh, in the mid 19th century to early 20th century. And the whole community is founded by Charles McAllister, who's this very wealthy uh, financier and advisor to presidents, very powerful man. He purchases this 84 acre tract right where the Poquessin Creek meets the Delaware River in 1850. He builds a villa at the point, which he calls Glengarry. He's Scottish, so a lot of his uh, property names are based on his Scottish heritage. Here's a view of it. This is the only view of the Glengarry before it became Glenford, which I'll explain in a moment. But this is one of the only uh, illustrations I know of the original home that was built there. Uh, McAllister names the larger estate he names his house Glengarry, but he names the larger estate Tarsdale with an I uh, after his family's ancestral estate uh, in Scotland. And then he subdivides this property and begins to sell lots to these wealthy class of Philadelphians who build these magnificent riverfront estates right along the Delaware River in Tarsdale. If many of you know like what is now um, Baker's Bay and Delaware Landing condominium developments, they, they were all these gorgeous estates in there. Uh, and this is really the beginning of Tarsdale as a distinct community around 1850. Uh, so there's the estate of Charles McAllister. This is map is after he died, but you can see all these uh, houses, uh, these properties, they, that was not there before 1850. Um, one of the properties that predated um, McAllister and his Glen Gary estate is the Bakehouse property. Um, uh, an ex-military general named Morgan uh, purchased this property called the Bakehouse property um, in the early 1800s. And the other uh, property that was there was the Robin Hood Hotel or Risden's Ferry, which was a hotel resort and ferry station right at the corner of Tarsdale. So these properties were there prior. Uh, and the Bakehouse took its name from this Evan Thomas, a Quaker baker and miller, who purchased a large tract there and built a large bake oven to service, uh, to create um, bread and biscuit for the ships that plied the, the Delaware River. And there was this, uh, wharf, you can see it sticking out there in the map and in the photo, uh, that made easy access uh, to the river. The, the water was very deep there. The ships could come close and get bread and biscuit from the bakehouse. So that's in the early 1700s. Uh, George W. Morgan, who's the son of a Revolutionary War general, acquires the property in 1822. He enlarges the home which is called Bakehouse One. He removes those bake ovens and that property remains in the Morgan family and the various descendants for over 150 years. And descendants uh, inherit it and purchase adjoining properties and marry and other people marry in. So it's all these Morgan families that are related living along this area of Tarsdale, which is 
pretty much where Del Air Landing is now. Um, so there was one bake, that's called Bakehouse One. That burned down in 1865. There was an article about it in the, in the New York Times. Uh, the family, um, the, the Fisher family, who are descendants of Morgan, uh, built a new mansion, which is called Bakehouse Two, this big stone you know, mansion. Um, and that is part of the family for uh, almost a hundred years. And then in 1940, that's the, around then is that's demolished and the stones are used to build a bakehouse three, which is still standing. So uh, Charles or Walter Massey Phillips, who is a descendant of the Morgans, inherited the property and he has that second bakehouse, the big, big one demolished, has the stones, uh, has the architects use the stones for this new bakehouse. He hires these uh, noted architects, Edmund Bacon, the famous city planner, and Oscar Stoneroff, a very modernist architect at the time. Uh, they build this Bakehouse 3. Bakehouse 3 in the modern style is now the uh, administrative offices for, um, is it Baker's Bay or is it uh, Del Air? Yeah, for Del Air Landing. Um, so that's Bakehouse 3 which is still there and is, is an office and a clubhouse for the condominium development. Um, so there's a Bakehouse 1, there's a Bakehouse 2, and then there's a Bakehouse 3. Three is still standing, the others are gone. Um, the next estate up is the Vancouver, the estate of Nelson Brown. If any of you have heard of Brown Brothers Harriman, the famous uh, financial firm, uh, he's, a, he's a descendant of that. Uh, and he builds an estate called Vancouver. Again, these are all estates that are um, built on the property that the Morgans had. Um, Nelson Brown is an avid equestrian and he has these tally-ho carriages. And in 1876, he builds this elaborate stable, most likely designed by the noted Philadelphia architect, Frank Furness. My wife, Patty, discovered that in an unpublished manuscript history of Tarsdale. Um, and this is an 1876 view of that stable. Uh, here's a shot of Nelson Brown in his tally-ho carriage in front of the stable. And here is a um, modern view of it. This is the clubhouse for the Baker's Bay condominium development along the river. So it's a beautiful um, structure and very much in the Frank Furness style. Um, so we, we're pretty sure it was built by him. And then uh, the Marlton Inn, who my, Patty's going to give a presentation on in December, um, was built on the sort of foundations of that Risden's Hotel, a Risden's Ferry uh, site. Um, and it becomes this really fancy club and resort in the corner of Philadelphia. Um, they have elaborate uh, gardens and uh, vistas and there's a casino on the property. There's dancing and dining and boating and fishing. These were all the elite of Philadelphia would come to Tarsdale for these for this resort that was the Marlton Inn. And it was owned by Edward Morell, who was a very famous, uh, or very influential Philadelphian, Northeast Philadelphian living in Tarsdale at the turn of the century. He was a congressman, a city councilman, a uh, leader in the Tarsdale community, uh, but he married, um, Louise Drexel, who was the sister of Catherine Drexel, the saint, and the, the, she was the daughter of Francis Drexel, uh, Drexel um, family of financiers. Francis Drexel and his brother, Anthony. Anthony is the founder of Drexel University. So anyway, uh, Edward Morell marries into this very wealthy, prominent family, and he uh, builds a number of improvements in Tarsdale and uh, becomes a leader in the Tarsdale community and owns this Marlton Inn, which becomes this very uh, famous uh, resort in the turn of the century period. These are the three Drexel daughters, um, Catherine in the middle there, and uh, Louise is the one that married um, uh, Edward Morell. Um, Francis Drexel, the father, had this summer estate built in Charsdale, uh, and um, they, the family used it as their summer retreat, and it's now part of the, um, it's called the Mansion House, it's on the campus of uh, Jefferson Tarsdale 
branch of, of Jefferson Hospital. Um, so it's, it, that's the family home, uh, the, the Drexel family home. So now uh, we come to the last sort of story in all this is um, going back to Glen Gary, uh, the estate that Charles McAllister built in Tarsdale that started the whole Tarsdale uh, sort of settlement. Um, so uh, McAllister dies and the property goes through different hands, gets, I think it's abandoned at one or uh, unlived in at one point. But Robert Forderer is a young um, uh, sort of mogul of leather manufacturing. He builds a huge leather manufacturing plant in Frankfurt, the world's largest manufacturer of leather. And he buys um, this estate called Glen Gary in 1895, and he renames it Glen Ford. He takes the Glen from Glen Gary, which was the name that the builder, Charles McAllister, gave it, and he takes the Ford from his name, Forderer, and he makes Glen Ford. And so that becomes the name of the Glen Ford estate. He undertakes these massive renovations to it, but he dies before uh, it's done. So he never actually lived there, uh, but his, uh, wife, his widow, and his children live there, his daughter lived there. And so this is Glen Ford today on the um, edge of Philadelphia, right where it empties, right where the Poquessin Creek empties into the Delaware River. It was the site of all these lavish Gilded Age parties and balls and whatnot. Um, it's the last remaining riverfront, Delaware riverfront estate that is open to the public. And it has spectacular collections. There's a museum, uh, you know, exhibit gallery, and you know, phenomenal stairways and interior spaces. And that's it. You, um, this is the Poquessing Creek entering into the Delaware River. And on the left side, that white building is Glen Ford. So that's kind of the uh, the final stop in our uh, tour of Northeast Philadelphia historical highlights. So it's kind of a whirlwind uh, <laughs> mashup of Northeast Philadelphia history. So that's that. Thank you. Um, many of you have probably heard this presentation before, but again, we're giving it again because we didn't want to risk technical difficulties if we had a new speaker. <laughs> so um, now comes the really challenging part where we're going to try to answer questions both from the live audience and via the Zoom audience in a way that everybody can hear and understand what the questions are. So, um, uh, okay. Is there any questions in there, Fred? Yeah, you can skip the compliments, just get the questions. <laughs> Uh, I don't believe there's any remnants of the Baldwin estate in Wisnoming. There and the Distin estate, there's a huge uh, complex of Distin buildings that are still there uh, that are trying to, uh, Taconi Historical Society is trying to get them listed as a historic district uh, on the city register. Uh, the Distins themselves did not live in Taconi. They, their business was in Tacony, but most of them lived in, in northeast, uh, north Philadelphia, like in, on the North Broad Street area. So the um, Baldwin estate, I think th that Wisnoming Baldwin estate, there's no trace of it. Uh, and the distant industrial complex, there are many buildings still there. And also one of the, I think uh, one or two of the distant family homes in North Philadelphia is still extant as well. What else? I'm sorry? Yes, I should have mentioned the Distin uh, company is still operating. It's now called Distin Precision. And uh, so at its height in the, so the question was, or the statement was 
that there's still a Distin company operating. And that's true. Uh, at its height, Distin had like 4,500 to 5,000 workers. I think the last time I checked, there was maybe a, a couple of dozen workers, like the company just downsized and downsized and specialized. So they now have a very specialized product they make with a small staff. But the Distin um, company, it's called Distin Precision, is still operating. Yeah, he's, uh, the speaker is talking about how the distant company sort of got bankrupt. It also had to do around the, the Great Depression, and there was a company or a, a, a what, do you, what do you call those guys that buy out distressed companies and try to turn them around? I think his name was Porter. Um, they tried to, HK Porter, yeah. So the company went through all kinds of um, uh, decline in the mid 20th century around the same time that the distant family members all sold out and it was no longer a family run company. All right, all right, hold on a minute, wait, yes. Okay, a gentleman here saying his father worked at distant. Right. Okay. 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 Right. So the gentleman is saying, so the uh, the people on Zoom can't hear you, so I have to I have to repeat everything. So that, yeah. So H K Porter bought out the company in '57 or so, moved it to Virginia, but there were still some remnants of the distant offices and, uh, and uh, equipment and all, uh, but most of the company moved to Virginia in the 50s. This was like after the family sold it. Uh, but then distant precision uh, is again, is a going concern there uh, still. So um, let me... Uh, Yeah, so Alex Palma is asking, uh, and I've heard this too. I don't know if it's true. I don't know how you would even check if it's true. The intersection of Frankfurt Avenue and Sheltonham Avenue, and that's, I guess that would be Wissanoming, um, is the only one anywhere where a cement, with a cemetery on all four corners. If you go to that intersection, I, I mean, that's, it's definitely true that there is a cemetery on all the corners. What I don't know, and I don't know how you would even check, is it, is it the only one in the country like that? I don't know. Was that? Everywhere you see it says it, I don't know whether it's true. All right, I'm gonna go around. Yes, Joe. There was a hotel called Weir's Hotel, which is still standing in Chicago. Yeah. It's current bar. Right. It looks like a municipal building. And the workers were allowed in there because it was a dry town. This thing didn't want people to drink. Well, that's not quite true because where that hotel was, he's talking about the Murs Hotel, uh, which is now Curran's Irish pub at um, uh, Longshore and uh, State Road. That's outside the distant estate boundaries. Those boundaries that you weren't allowed to sell alcohol, uh, stopped at Tarsdale Avenue. And well, it was used by the visiting salesmen at all, but the distant didn't want any workers to work with drinking. Not someone, he was a drinker, I'm sure, right. but he didn't want production soda. And that's true till today. That yeah. In the actual estate, there's no- uh, Yeah, the distant estate, um, well, first of all, uh, um, Joe was saying that distant, there was this uh, hotel bar very near the distant factory and distant himself and probably his sons didn't want the workers going in there and obviously drinking and trying to, you know, be productive if they're drinking. Uh, although uh, Henry distant himself was known to be a bit of a drinker, but um, the distant estate, which has these set boundaries, basically almost to Frankfurt Avenue, I think from Princeton Avenue to McGee, right? North, okay, and Tarsdale Avenue. Uh, within that distant estate, uh, alcohol could not be sold. 
and, and, and there were other restrictions too. And um, there was a restaurant or something on Tarsdale Avenue that wanted to have a liquor license and they um, challenged the distant state restriction and the thing went all through the courts and dragged out and the community won. Uh, the liquor license was denied and the um, ban on alcohol within the distant state is still in effect. You can drink it there. You just can't sell it or make it. The one thing, well, one thing I did hear on the same subject yes. was that there's a social club that the distance ran for like the people in the area and they allowed, they may have allowed beer in there. Well, probably. Yeah. I mean, yeah. a social club, they would not be doing. Yeah, it, was their, it was their building. I mean, they built it right. and it was like a club for the workers and they, they would allow beer in there, apparently, at least on some occasions. Okay, that might be true. <laughs> so, yes. Oh, that's right. Thank you. Now, Patty is clarifying the Mears Hotel that we were talking about earlier was demolished when they built 95. The uh, what is now the Curran's. Uh, Irish pub is uh, was the Arbot Hotel. Yeah, H begins with an H. Okay, all right. Yes, Dan. Uh, I have a question and comment. What did they? What did they do? What was the uh, Frankfurt Village uh, at the state of what is there now? And the comment is uh, you mentioned Pullman and Piston had communities that were able to uh, restrict the people living. There was also a glass manufacturer down around the athletic ground. Yeah, that, that was. Yeah, that's true. Uh, that was before. So uh, there's two statements and questions. Um, and I can't remember that. Where, where was the Frankfurt Stadium? Yeah, the, uh, the, the Frankfurt. Um, Frankfurt Yellow Jacket Stadium. Uh, it was on Frankfurt Avenue, and I think was it. Uh, Devereaux, yeah, Frankfurt and Devereaux. I can't, I scroll back to find, but Frankfurt and Devereaux. Um, and I think it was on the west side of Frankfurt Avenue. So it's really in, in Wissanoming. And then I can't remember the guy's name that you're talking about. He had this uh, kind of unusual little um, religious community around his cl uh, glass manufacturer uh, right on the Delaware River in, in like Kensington. Do you remember the name, Alan? Dyer. Dyer, yeah. Dyer, D-Y-O-T-T, thank you. And he was kind of a, a character, a bit of a religious fanatic. So he, he wanted uh, all teetotalers in his village and he wanted, uh, uh, he had education and Sunday school. Then also he got convicted of all kinds of nefarious business deals. He got put in prison. So he wasn't such a holy roller. But that was much earlier and much smaller and much more temporary. It didn't last that long. Uh, the, the communities that we're talking about in, in Pullman and Distant lasted, you know, well into the 20th century. So, yeah. Yes, Alan. Yeah, on the location of the Yellow Jacket community, and the Robinson Avenue, just east of Frankfurt Avenue, goes right through the Okay. Uh, well, just below the all right, so we have some clarification on the location of the Yellow Jacket Stadium in uh, Harbison Avenue, where it crosses Frankfurt, it sort of goes diagonally through what was the field, and it's just below Devereaux on Frankfurt, right? Is that what you said? Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay, so clarification. Yeah. Yes, sir. Ooh. Uh, yeah, he asked what year was 95 built in the Northeast and what was there before? I mean, I'm sorry? Houses. Yeah, well, it was, I think it was the late 60s. It was the late 60s where it got finished. It didn't get finished in downtown. That took years later, but it, uh, in the late 60s. And um, I mean, the railroad ran right along adjacent to what became 95. Other than the railroad, 
Uh, I'm not sure what was there other than some houses and um, it wasn't like they demolished lots and lots of uh, communities to build it. I think the railroad kind of was just, they just went right along the railroad that had been there since the 1840s. Yes, Julie. All right, well, the question was, uh, is, what, is the presentation recorded and can it be shown again? And the answer is yes, it was recorded. We will send out a link to it once we get it all edited down. Uh, again, we communicate with everybody through our Facebook page, the Northeast Philadelphia History Network Facebook page, or our email address if you're on our email list. We send out the links to the presentations that we have here. Uh, so you'll you will get that. Um, yes. Right. Right. That's the Marlton Inn that I was talking about. Yeah. So uh, the question was, just south of Glenford is the is the yacht club, and then just south of that is a mansion, and that's what the Marlton Inn was. It's, it's radically. Uh, you know, renovated and changed, but it was the Marlton Inn building. No, he didn't build, well, he didn't, he built it. Oh, he did build it, okay. I thought he just bought it and managed it. So uh, Edward Morell, my wife has given the presentation in a couple of months. Uh, he built it and then it had it managed by somebody, but. Well, it's a private home. He was the brother-in-law of McAllister, wasn't he? He might have been. Sandy, right? Sandy, I'm certain. Sandy, I'm certain. Sandy, And so um, trying to recap all that, a man named Hopkins, who I think owned it in the maybe 1870s, or, we're talking about the, the Morelton Inn building, which is now a private home. Um, a man named Hopkins bought it and knocked down Risden's Hotel, which had been there for many years, and built a new building, or, built a home, there on the foundation. And then later Edward Morell purchased that and uh, expanded it and uh, you know enhanced it into the Morelton Inn. And then the Morelton Inn eventually closed and became a private property again and then eventually a private home. Yes. What was now floor of what was the church there? Yeah, Eden Hall, the sisters of the well, uh, I'm not sure who owned it before, but uh, the Sisters of the Sacred Heart built Eden Hall. The question is what uh, Fleur Park, which is in, in East Tarsdale along Grant Avenue. Um, <clears throat> uh, the convent was built in, or the school was built in the 1840s, was it? Yeah, the, the, the Sisters of the Sacred Heart, isn't that it? Madam, Madam. What's that? Madam. Madams of the Sacred Heart. It was a, a religious order. Um, they built a school and a convent there, I think, in the 1840s, right? Before that, it was built in the 1860s. So it was built in the 1860s. And then it was built in the 1860s. Oh, right. Right. A uh, man named Barry, there's a Barry Road back there. A man named Barry had that estate. And then the, the religious order bought it and expanded it. And then it became Eden Hall, which was a school and a convent, and then private school for wealthy Catholic girls. Yeah, right. Do you know where Well, Morell Park. I think the, like if, if uh, the question is where Morell's house was, which um, 
was known as San Jose, Mor Edward Morell and Louise Drexel Morell. Um, I think if you go down Morell Avenue from Frankfurt, you go down a little hill and then you go up a little hill. I think it was kind of at the top of that hill. It was kind of like where the school is. Well, that's basically there. Yeah, where John Hancock Public School and Elementary School is. No. All right, I, there's no way I'm going to summarize all that. So it's just a, information on where Edward Morell lived, where the uh, entrance to the Morell estate was, and how it related to Tarsdale Country Club. Yes, Julie, one more question. Put the mic, I can't hear you. The hotel is Frankfurt. It's not a hotel. I was just wondering what that is. It's an auto shop. Yeah. All right. Uh, Fred, are there any more um, chat questions? Oh, okay. I think we kind of made it through this uh, unscathed. Yes. <laughs> There were 45 people online. Did you count? How many? 30. So 75 people all together, which is not a bad time. Jack, can, uh, can I make an announcement? Uh, okay, go ahead. Uh, the GAR Museum, uh, we're having a grand opening on September 18th of our new uh, building down at 8110 uh, Frankfurt Avenue. And uh, the building will be open from 11 till, well, well, they're going to have a concert at the Episcopal Church, uh, the Emmanuel Episcopal Church Hall up at 8201 Frankfurt by the uh, 28th Pennsylvania Band. If, ever, if you ever seen them, they're really good. Uh, and that'll be at two o'clock and the museum will be open both before and after that. Okay, so I know you all heard that in uh, live land here, but the new GAR Museum and Library, which moved from Frankfurt to Holmesburg, is going to have their grand opening on September 18th? Yeah. Right, okay, and with uh, bands and all kinds of stuff and an open house. So that, yeah, something to look forward to. Okay, thanks everybody for bearing with us. <laughs> <laughs>